All right, so today the topic of discussion is hybrid snakes. And when I'm talking about hybrids, I'm talking about breeding a ball python with a different species of snake, getting something that's half ball python and half something else. And let me tell you, what I'm gonna show you today is probably gonna blow your mind. You probably didn't even realize some of these hybrids existed. And before we get into the topic of discussion, I wanna share a couple things with you. First, in just three weeks, there's a reptile show coming up, Reptilian nation denver uh, and that is june 8th and 9th and i'll definitely be there with a table selling some snakes hope to see you there and then the very next weekend the following weekend is denver repticon i'll be at both shows selling some of my some of my snakes it'll be pretty awesome and then i actually started another hobby and i decided not to put it in this channel i spun it out into a separate channel and that is treasure hunting <laughs> and i've always been you know curious about treasure hunting I figured I'd take the dive and do some videos I'm thinking maybe weekly videos once a week on treasure hunting and my first video I just posted it I'm gonna post the link underneath this video so you can go to my channel and check it out make sure you subscribe and share I'm basically starting at zero views and zero subscribers on that channel and hoping to really gain some momentum on my treasure hunting channel and and the first video was actually about magnets and and if you watch that video, I'll show you how I'm gonna treasure hunt with some magnets. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a colleague of mine today and I said, oh yeah, I started this channel treasure hunting. And he's like, oh yeah, actually I have some mineral rights to some property up in the mountains of Colorado and we go hunting for gems. I thought that was pretty cool. And who knows where it's gonna take me. You know, I could end up, you know, standing at the Temple of Doom next to Indiana Jones. And the one advantage that I have is I can handle the snake no problem at all just show me where the treasure is so that's kind of a new adventure that I'm taking in, in addition to this channel so this channel basically I put out videos every day at 6 p.m. trying to do daily videos then the other channel you would you probably want to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be alerted to new videos because it'll be pretty sporadic I'm not sure if I can you know do weekly videos on a regular schedule or if you know I'll have kind of uh, videos kind of all over the place kind of popping up here and there. It's probably the case at first until I get more established with where I'm really going with that channel. So let's jump back into the discussion of hybrid snakes. It's a really, I'd say it's a really controversial topic. There's a lot of people really for it and there's a lot of people really against it. I'd say most people that are breeders, like on the scale that I am, you know, producing a hundred or more snakes a year, most people I'd say are pretty much against hybrid snakes. And some people dabble with it on, a little bit on the side, but the, the problem is, is you really never know what the result's gonna be. So for example, if you bred like a small snake to a big snake, or you, you bred, bred a snake that's on the ground you, to a snake that crawls in the trees, and you get something that you really don't know how to care for it. Is this, are, an arboreal species or is it you know a land ground dwelling species and you kind of, things kind of get mixed up to where you're not really sure what you're going to get and what the care requirements are for some of these snakes and what I want to do is I want to show you some of these snakes online. I pulled up some websites and showed you, I'll show you some of the crosses and some of the stuff is, you know, I didn't even know some of it existed. I started digging deeper and I was like, wow, I can't even believe this is the case. And, and you know, a lot of people, they're really afraid. I think, you know, if you crossed like a cobra, which is really venomous to like a reticulated python, which is a really huge 20 foot snake and people are thinking, all right, you know, now you have a 20 foot venomous snake snake you know the, the the huge killer snake that nobody can you know even handle and it's not really been the case as far as what I'm seeing and there's really not a crossover between venomous and non venomous it seems like they have different genetics where you can't really cross them so so in some cases you can actually cross them and it's kind of like the mule you'll get like a sterile offspring some of it is actually viable where you can continue the line and some of it gets really diluted and concentrated like it's 15% one snake, 36% you know, another snake, and, and, and it gets really confused trying to track all the genetics from the parents as you keep adding more and more snakes to the genetic makeup of these hybrids. So let's jump into this, uh, this the internet, kind of I'll show you what's out there and what I'm seeing on the internet. 
All right, so let's start with this snake. This is, you probably recognize this before, this is a Desert Phase California King Snake, a very popular snake. Some people have actually crossed this with a corn snake, and believe it or not, these two will breed together. You get something that's half and half. That is what we call a jungle corn. And if you buy a baby jungle corn snake, you may or may not realize you are actually buying something that is half California king snake and half corn snake, which is pretty interesting. And they say the uh, these are can actually breed and lay eggs, and the jungle corns are also really variable when it comes to color because of the, how the genetics kind of play on each other. Sometimes you can get extremely different colors and patterns in the same clutch of eggs, which is kind of interesting. So let's move over to a ball python. So if you take a ball python that's relatively small, you know, very probably one of the most friendliest snakes, you breed it with a blood python. Blood pythons can get pretty big, you know, they can get a decent size and they're naturally more aggressive than a ball python. They kind of have, a lot of them have attitudes. I've seen some tame ones, but usually when they start out, you know, if they're not handled a lot, they can naturally have a pretty bad attitude. You mix the two together and you get what we call a super ball. And a super ball is half blood python, half ball python. And it almost kind of looks like a big ball python with an attitude. <laughs> That's kind of what I've seen as far as most of the super balls. You know, most of these snakes, you can tame them down, but it takes a little more work with some of the more aggressive ones. But that is a really interesting cross. So if we go back to the ball python, this time let's cross it with a different snake. We will cross it with an Australian Woma python. I've actually considered doing this cross early on. And I decided I didn't really want to do hybrids at that time, but this is actually what you get right here. This is half ball python and half woma python. That is a really beautiful snake. And the interesting thing is the woma pythons have an incredible feeding response. So you can have something that kind of looks like a ball python. It almost looks like some kind of fancy morph, but it has an incredible feeding response of the woma. It's probably longer and skinnier, I would say, as an adult than uh, than a regular ball python. Here's an interesting cross. Let's do a Burmese python. This is the Burmese python that uh, it's in the pet trade. It's also one of the biggest problems in Florida, <laughs> the wild Burmese pythons. You can actually cross that with a reticulated python and you get a snake that's half and half. And what we call that is a Borneo bat eater. <laughs> if you've ever heard of Borneo bat eaters or if you bought one, you may not realize it's half Burmese python and half reticulated python. A really beautiful snake. Both snakes get extremely large. So you're looking at something that's going to get, you know, probably 10 to 15 feet at least for a Borneo bat eater, which is a pretty wild name for that combo. So let's go back to the ball python. We cross the ball python with a carpet python. Believe it or not, you can cross them together and this is a wild combo. Take a look at this. This is a what we call a carpal. It's like a really long and skinny ball python. It's really kind of interesting. So let's go back to the ball python. This time we'll cross it. Believe it or not, you can cross a ball python with a reticulated python. I've never actually heard of it. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't even seem like it's possible because, because of the size difference. And I suppose if you get them at the right age, maybe a really older, a big mature ball python and a really young adult, uh, uh, yeah, you'd have to figure out how to do it as far as the size difference. But apparently someone has done it and you get a ball retic cross. And of course the guy that did it first uh, probably the only time that anyone's probably ever thought about doing it is, you know, Nerds Facility, Kevin at New England Reptile. So <laughs> it's kind of a, an interesting cross. You get a 14-foot ball python, <laughs> which is pretty, I'd like to see the adult on that one. It would be pretty interesting. So let's go back to the ball python. This time we're going to cross it with a Burmese python. 
So what you're doing is you, it's kind of the same. You're breeding a big snake with a little snake, apparently as possible, and you get what's known as a berm ball. And look, that is a really beautiful snake. As a matter of fact, I've seen a lot of people doing these crosses with some of the mutations in the ball python. So we're not just talking about a straight ball python, we're talking about you know pinstripes and pastels and some of that stuff. And sometimes you can get like a coral glow berm ball or some, <laughs> something like that Well, you'll actually see some of the mutation from the ball python going into some of these hybrids which I thought was pretty amazing so let's go back to the ball python this time we're going to cross it with an angolan python and the result is what we call an angry ball <laughs> angolan and ball python angry ball I thought that was a pretty clever twist on words and it doesn't look too different than a regular ball python it's kind of interesting and let's see this is this is kind of an interesting one so this is a green tree python people have actually bred the green tree to a carpet python and when you breed the two together you get what is known as a carpondro half carpet and half green tree python which is that's a pretty wild snake i'm not quite sure if i like the green tree better than this or this i suppose you can mix a lot of different stuff with it um it's kind of an interesting cross on this one because it's kind of brings out uh, half the yellow and half the green and some of these you know once you st once you start kind of crossing them I've actually seen some people what they do is they breed something like this back to one of the parents and then what happens is it's like you know 25% uh, green tree python and then 75% carpet and then they'll cross it with something else like an angola python and they're keeping track of all these percentages as it goes and it kind of gets really confusing and muddy that's just kind of one of the things you really have to watch when you're dealing with these hybrids. All right, so I actually have what some people would consider a somewhat of a hybrid, I guess, and that is this big boy. He's a reticulated python. He is actually part super dwarf, part dwarf, and part mainland, and it's kind of the same with um, kind of like hybrids. So this one's actually 37.5% super dwarf, 50% Jampea dwarf, and 12.5% mainland. So you really have to, you know, really have to track your percentages of each. And really what this is, is it's not really, I would say it's not really kind of different subspecies. It's really all the same species. <laughs> this guy's going all over the place. What it really is, is it's different localities. So this is, you know, the, the actually the super dwarf in the snake is from kind of an unspecified island. It was one of the first super dwarfs ever found on one of these islands. And this guy's going back in his tub. <laughs> and a lot of people are pretty much purists. Let me put this guy back. He's getting a little squirrely. <laughs> Yeah, that guy, that guy's always been really squirrely. <laughs> I kind of handle him and he's just flying all over the place. That's about as long as I can handle him before he just flies out of my hands. But really what it comes down to is a lot of people are purists when it comes down to like the dwarfs and the super dwarfs. Everyone wants to know if it's dwarf, where, what island does that dwarf come from? Is it Jampea? Is it another island? And there's a lot of these islands that, you know, the, uh, a specific locality comes from. You know, some people just want Kalatoa, super dwarf and they only want to work with that specific strain and you start crossing it with all this other stuff and it gets really complicated because you're keeping track of all the genetics and the percentages it's kind of like a hybrid you know what is the percentage of corn snake in my king snake <laughs> and that's that's the other thing that you know people really have a problem with especially if you start crossing some of these snakes and something happens to the person that has it loses the records or something sells it and then you're buying a snake you don't know if it's pure especially with a retic you know you buy a retic i've seen some people do this they'll buy a retic thinking it's a mainland and it only gets you know the, you know, the size of a woma python it stays really small not knowing that they may have a super dwarf or something like that so it's really important to 
to track localities if possible. And a lot of people frown on hybrids. That's that's probably one of the biggest thing is because what you're doing is you're really diluting the gene pool. You don't know if you're if you're buying a snake if it's a hybrid snake if it has some other kind of snake in there and what the care is for that specific snake. And personally, I'm really I'm pretty much you know I started out I guess I was four hybrid snakes at the beginning, and then the further I get into it, it's like I really don't want to buy a snake off a of Craigslist and have to worry about you know if there's jungle uh, you know carpet python in my ball python that I'm bringing into my collection because you know if I breed it through it as a breeder that'd be kind of devastating. Working some other species of a genetics through my collection, it'd be pretty difficult. And pretty much the other thing is, is when you start breeding these together, you really don't know if you're going to get viable offspring, if it's going to be, you know, a good cross. You might get slugs after slugs after slugs. You don't know why and come to find out that it's actually a hybrid instead of a pure ball python. So that's pretty much it. That is where I stand on hybrids. I pretty much frown on all hybrids except for the reticulated pythons. When it comes to retics, I think pretty much universally people expect and that you know they, they accept that you can actually breed the super dwarfs and dwarfs as long as you keep track of the percentages and it's perfectly fine within the reptile industry. So that's it. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.